Today, we are very pleased to welcome Professor Stephen Dykus, uh, who is a professor emeritus at Vermont Law School, where he's been on the faculty for 44 years. He is the author or co-author of more than a dozen books, including National Defense and the Environment, and author of many articles on environmental and national security issues. He was chair of the environmental law section of the Association of American Law Schools and founding chair of the AALS section on national security law. He was also the founding co-editor in chief of the Journal of National Security Law and Policy. His latest book co-edited with Eugene Fidel at Yale and published last year is called COVID-19, The Legal Challenges. In 2001, Professor Dykus wrote an article for the Vermont Law Review entitled, Nuclear War, Still the Gravest Threat to the Environment. Now, 20 years later, that is also the title of his talk. Please join me in welcoming Professor Stephen Dykus. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm sorry that I can't see you face to face or <clears throat> that we can't be meeting outside on this beautiful day, but uh, we'll do the best we can. I always like to begin my classes with a poem, and I'll do that today. <clears throat> it's just a very short poem by Robert Frost. It's called, It Bids Pretty Fair, uh, and it's set as a dramatic production. It goes like this. The play seems out for an almost infinite run. <clears throat> Don't mind a little thing like the actors fighting. The only thing I worry about is the sun. We'll be all right if nothing goes wrong with the lighting. And Robert Frost published several poems about nuclear war in 1947, along with this one, although he couldn't possibly have known anything about nuclear winter, yet that's exactly what this poem portends. Nuclear winter, uh, some of you know, um, involves the uh, explosion of a nuclear weapon at or near ground level uh, and depending on uh, where it is, <clears throat> lofting black carbon particles into the atmosphere where they would circulate and block sunlight around the world for years. <clears throat> the result would be, uh, again, depending on how many explosions and where, uh, the result uh, could be drought, and famine that might kill a billion people. That's billion with a B. In addition, again, depending on where the explosion took place, there would be immediate deaths from blast, from fire, from ionizing radiation, uh, deaths in, in, uh, might amount to millions. Uh, there would be longer lasting morbidity from radioactive fallout, uh, longer still illnesses from cancer, genetic mutations. <clears throat> In the meantime, uh, when the uh, explosion occurred, Almost every unprotected electri electrical device uh, uh, in the area and all the electric uh, power grids uh, would go down because of something called an electromagnetic pulse. You can imagine what the result of that would be. <clears throat> in 1996, in an advisory opinion from the uh, International Court of Justice, the World Court, <clears throat> the court said this, quote, the destructive power of nuclear weapons cannot be contained in either space or time. 
They have the potential to destroy all civilization and the entire ecosystem of the planet, end quote. So we should be asking ourselves <clears throat> why we're still facing this threat uh, 75 years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, we imagine that uh, with the end of the Cold War, uh, nuclear war would never happen, uh, could never happen. That was wrong. <clears throat> it's also, it's just too hard to think about this. It's too frightening. It's certainly not polite dinner table conversation or for that matter, lunchtime conversation. But here we are. All the, everything about uh, nuclear war is extremely complex, hard to understand. Um, <clears throat> partly as a result, uh, we've adopted, many of us have adopt, adopted a, a sense of resignation. Nuclear weapons cannot be uninvented. Everybody's got them. You just sort of have to hope for the best. Many in the uh, government and in the military still think that we can deter a nuclear war by having faster, more destructive weapons than our uh, potential enemies. And our allies in NATO and the Far East depend on our promise. <clears throat> this is US policy, depend on our promise to use nuclear weapons if they are attacked by Russian or Chinese conventional forces. And last but not least, defense contractors spend millions, millions lobbying to build new nuclear weapons. There are other grave environmental threats, of course, um, prominent among them, uh, a new uh, coronavirus pandemic. We hope that uh, we'll learn from uh, our current experience climate change and overpopulation are both existential threats. We're busy now building renewable energy, energy sources and uh, uh, engaging in family planning to try to avoid the worst effects of these. We're also working on adaptation But nuclear war is different. <clears throat> it's what some call a black swan event. That is something that's uh, unlikely to happen. But if it does, the consequences will be enormous. The only way to eliminate this threat is to eliminate the weapons themselves. <clears throat> and as you know, no adaptation is possible. So right now, <clears throat> there are about 14,000 nuclear weapons uh, worldwide. Of these, about 3,600, 3,600 uh, nuclear warheads are deployed right now on ICBMs, submarines, aircraft, artillery, and half of these, about 1,800, are on high alert status. That is, they're ready for immediate use. <clears throat> what we now know is that the detonation of only a handful of these, maybe six or eight, could precipitate a nuclear winter and kill a billion people maybe many more. How are we responding to this? 
uh, as a nation, we're engaged uh, along with the Russians in a program of what we're calling modernization. That is, we're building new ICBMs, new land-based missiles, new submarine-based weapons. Uh, in the process, we're slated to build, um, uh, to, we're <clears throat> planning to spend uh, about $1.2 trillion, $1.2 trillion on these new weapons over the next 30 years. Well, you might ask, how likely is a nuclear war? The answer is, um, it, it certainly can happen and almost has on a number of occasions. Uh, the best possibility is by accident or mistake there have been many, many near misses. <clears throat> uh, U.S. nuclear forces were placed on high alert uh, a few years back when NORAD uh, misread a, uh, uh, its radar and saw the moon rising over Norway as an incoming nuclear attack. Uh, other alerts have been prompted by uh, a bear climbing a, a, a fence in Minnesota, uh, a number of times by computer operators misreading training programs as signaling actual attacks. And you remember just a couple of years ago, uh, the entire state of Hawaii was alerted to an incoming nuclear attack uh, for about 20 minutes. Again, the result of uh, misreading a training program. Well, that's not the only risk. In 1974, uh, when Richard Nixon was facing impeachment, he was drunk uh, much of the time, and the Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State uh, instructed the chain of command that they should only respond to uh, orders from the president if they came through the two of them, the two secretaries. Last year in 2020, you remember that Donald Trump underwent treatment for COVID-19. He was treated for several days with a drug called dexamethasone, which makes some patients paranoid and delusional and creates feelings of euphoria and invulnerability. Just imagine the possibilities. Uh, the bottom line here is that we've been extremely lucky so far, but we don't know how long our luck is going to hold. <clears throat> Some think that a nuclear war could be limited. Bear in mind that the one of the immediate effects of any nuclear attack will be loss of communications because of an electromagnetic pulse. Uh, that'll make it uh, difficult or nearly impossible for the president to um, know what's going on. Uh, a key aspect of our uh, deterrence policy is that we're ready to launch on warning, that is, uh, uh, whenever we um, have information about an incoming attack, the idea is that we need to be able to uh, use it or lose it. That is, if we don't launch our nuclear weapons before the enemy weapons arrive to destroy them, 
uh, then we won't be able to retaliate. <clears throat> and uh, incidentally, we only had minutes, like 10 minutes to decide uh, whether to launch um, Part of our modernization policy is to create new uh, so-called tactical nuclear weapons. Former Secretary uh, Mattis uh, said repeatedly, however, that there's no such thing as a tactical nuclear weapon. They're all strategic. That's because the effects of their use would be to likely to escalate into a general nuclear war and the uh, strategic implications are uh, therefore obvious. Some think that a missile defense program might protect us. Well, so far, uh, the success of U.S. testing of its missile defense program, now 30 years old, the success rate of our test is only about 50%. And all of those tests have been conducted under uh, con tightly controlled conditions, uh, unrealistic because <clears throat> they didn't involve uh, the use by an enemy of um, avoidance tactics. Uh, incidentally, the uh, ballistic missile defense program of the United States has provoked a new arms race, as it uh, predictably would China, for example which long relied on a minimum deterrent strategic force of about 20 odd weapons uh, has now grown that number to more than 200. Just what you do uh, if you needed to overcome uh, a first strike from an enemy like the United States. So, <clears throat> In light of all this, in light of the uh, uh, profound threat to the human environment from a US nuclear weapon, you might ask whether the Defense Department or DOE has ever prepared an environmental impact statement uh, as required by NEPA. The answer is apparently not. Even if an EIS like this were classified, we uh, need to know that it's been done. Uh, it might, after all, influence US strategic planning. That's the point of NEPA, after all. In 1996, the World Court, the International Court of Justice, um, issued an advisory opinion on the legality of nuclear weapons. <clears throat> it noted that there are two treaties, two 1997 treaties, Protocol 1 to the Geneva uh, Accords and the Environmental Modification Treaty. Both of these prohibit the use of weapons or methods of warfare that might be expected to cause, uh, and I'm quoting here, widespread long-term and severe impacts to the environment. That of course is precisely what nuclear weapons would do. But the court found that the uh, each state's sovereign right of self-defense trumps any environmental concerns and the application of these two treaties. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the court said ironically, <clears throat> in any sort of war, 
the law of armed conflict always applies. And that, that law, the law of war, requires that any use of force be necessary, that is, that, um, uh, that it be uh, critical to the accomplishment of a legitimate uh, military objective, that is, that there be no reasonable alternative. Uh, next, the law of war requires distinction in the use of force. That is, that <clears throat> any attack distinguish between uh, military targets and non-combatant civilian targets, something that nuclear weapons, of course, can never do. And the law of war requires proportionality in the use of force. That is, <clears throat> you can't use a hammer to kill a mosquito. All states exercising their inherent right of self-defense, the court said, must comply with these principles. <clears throat> but of course, uh, they couldn't. The court recognized this in a way. It said that it could not, uh, that the use of nuclear weapons would generally be, I'm quoting again, generally be contrary to the rules of international law applicable in armed conflict. But then it went on to say that although every state must comply with these rules, it could not say, the court said, it could not say that the use of a nuke would be illegal if a, if a state found in what he called an extreme circumstance of self-defense in which its very survival would be at stake. That state wanted to use a nuclear weapon in an extreme circumstance of self-defense in which its very survival would be at stake. In other words, in other words, it might be okay for a weak state that uh, believes, rightly or wrongly, that it faces an existential threat. It might be okay for that state to launch a nuclear uh, weapon to stop an enemy invasion with even with conventional forces. We need to be thinking here about states like North Korea, Pakistan, Iran. Incidentally, <clears throat> the United States claims that it could and would use nuclear weapons to stop an invasion of its NATO allies by conventional Russian forces. At the end of its decision in 1996, the World Court uh, urged all states to uh, engage in complete nuclear disarmament as uh, those states promised to do in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. <clears throat> in 2017, the United Nations uh, uh, put out its a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Under that treaty, each non-nuclear state promises never to develop, test, produce, or otherwise acquire nuclear weapons. And current nuclear states would promise to get rid of theirs. Uh, all this would take place um, uh, uh, with uh, very intrusive inspection programs. The United States, um, like the other nuclear states, has refused to sign this treaty. 
It insists that the elimination of all nuclear weapons is unrealistic. This is uh, uh, our words, unrealistic and, and unverifiable, uh, ignoring the fact, for example, that um, the 1993 Chemical Weapons Convention uh, uh, includes an ex exquisitely detailed and highly effective inspection regime. And the United States says uh, deterrence will continue to keep the peace. Well, we might hope so. The treaty, incidentally, uh, is now in force, ratified by more than 50 non-nuclear states, but not by yet by any nuclear ones. In January of this year, <clears throat> the Federation of American Scientists moved the hands of its doomsday clock uh, to just 100 seconds, a minute and 40 seconds before midnight, midnight marking a nuclear apocalypse. That's the closest it's been in 75 years. So what to do about all this? <clears throat> well, one thing is to learn more about this threat uh, a good place to start is uh, a marvelous book um, published last year by Fred Kaplan called The Bomb, Presidents, Generals, and the Secret History of Nuclear War. Here's that book. Uh, you might also want to subscribe to the free website of the Federation of American Scientists. This is a reliable source of information about uh, a nuclear war. And um, as a lawyer, as a public citizen, help educate the public, your neighbors, about the nature and the gravity of this threat. Let them know about the false promises of uh, U.S. deterrence policy and ballistic missile defense. Let them know about the role of defense contractors in uh, perpetuating our reliance on these weapons. Tell them about the expense and explain to them that there are alternatives, the most important being elimination of these weapons. We're best equipped to do this as lawyers, to expose the facts, to interpret them for the public, to work for changes in policy, to help elect officials who are committed to eliminating this threat. If we fail to eliminate nuclear weapons, and we allow this gravest environmental threat to continue, then <clears throat> we may need to follow the instructions on that uh, 1960s era duck and cover poster. You know, the one I'm talking about. It says, <clears throat> in the event of a nuclear attack, place your hands behind your head Put your head between your knees and kiss your ass goodbye. So thanks very much to, uh, for listening uh, to this uh, dreadful talk, lunchtime talk uh, on such a beautiful day. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, <clears throat> Professor Dykus. Indeed, not the most uplifting talk, but we've sort of become accustomed to such things in the, in the past year and a half, I'd say. Um, okay, so for our um, for our listeners, we have a few minutes to ask some questions, and um, 
As a reminder, if you're watching on our website live stream, click on the icon at the bottom of the video and that will bring up the chat box where you can add questions. Or if you're watching on our Facebook live stream, add your question to the comment box below and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible. First question is, and you gave a couple of um, suggestions toward the end of your talk about ways that people could become more informed about these topics, but you know, the nature of national security is that it's cloaked in secrecy um, and it, it can be a very difficult topic for the public to get information about. Um, you know, many public interest requests have exceptions for national security um, and the public is often left to kind of read between the lines in terms of presidential uh, meetings like the recent one with um, Putin and Russia and what are ways that the public can track and interpret um, what's going on in terms of these signals internationally? Well, uh, secrecy has always been an issue, uh, especially in this area. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's always been hard to find out exactly what's going on. Uh, during the uh, Trump administration, for example, the, um, uh, the government stopped its policy of publishing information about our inventories of nuclear weapons. But, you know, um, it's also been really difficult over many years to uh, get uh, relevant facts about what's going on with the environment more generally. Um, uh, so it's, um, we've had to work hard to find out about um, uh, pollution, uh, uh, about uh, planning for uh, various environmentally destructive uh, activities that might be permitted by the government, or they might be go uh, might go on uh, without the government's permission. Uh, <clears throat> regarding nuclear uh, weapons, um, however, there is a, a huge body of information uh, that is public, that is accessible. Uh, on uh, sites like the Arms Control Association. Uh, these mostly try to play it straight, although uh, they, uh, like me, uh, are interested in eliminating nuclear weapons because of the threat they pose. So uh, the bottom line here is that uh, a little bit of digging will yield a lot of information and make it clear, I think, uh, to everybody uh, how great this threat is and uh, how it might be abated. Thank you. Um, we recently saw the effect that uh, hackers can have on the distribution of energy through the, the hacking of the, um, the, the I think it was the gas pipeline recently um, where the uh, utility had to pay off the hackers in order to continue the distribution of energy. Um, how, are, how are governments protecting against hacking into um, nuclear weapons, but also um, is there a concern over hacking into nuclear plants for energy? Well, what a great question and a scary one. Um, <clears throat> I, I hope that nuclear weapon, nuclear power plants, and uh, I hope especially that the uh, nuclear weapons chain of command is more secure than the um, uh, colonial pipeline and more secure than the Office of Management and Budget and a number of other government offices that have been hacked uh, in the last year or two. Uh, the fact is that uh, 
uh, cyber intrusions are uh, a really, really very serious threat. Um, we know, for example, we know this, the FBI has told us that um, Russia has implanted malware in the control systems of our electric grids. <clears throat> And that, uh, uh, at least until recently, all that stood between us and uh, a nationwide blackout was a political decision uh, to pull the trigger. So it's not hard to imagine in light of uh, the hacking we know about recently, that the same kind of peril uh, uh, <clears throat> awaits uh, in the control of the uh, nuclear weapons chain of command. All the more reason to work toward the elimination of a threat like this that could be set off without our intent uh, uh, by our, or corrupted somehow by our enemies. That's deeply disturbing. Um, so what similarities or differences have you found in terms of the um, policies or politics around biological warfare as compared to nuclear warfare? What have been some of the findings of your work, your research regarding COVID-19? Well, um... In 1925, the, um, uh, uh, all the nations of the world agreed in the uh, Hague Conventions that they would outlaw the use of biological weapons. <clears throat> that in the wake of World War One, and I think, I think that agreement. Uh, grew out of a, um, an appreciation of the, both the horror of the use of uh, weapons like that, also the potential that they held for getting out of control, that is uh, for the use of contagious uh, pathogens that might trigger a pandemic like the one we're, uh, we're in currently. And also the fact that, um, uh, that <clears throat> however effective these weapons might be in defeating an enemy, that there were alternatives that made their use uh, unnecessary or at least optional. So all that together, I think convinced us to agree, uh, as we did later on in a specific convention dealing with biological weapons, to agree that they shouldn't be used again and wouldn't. Uh, <clears throat> whether and to what extent uh, nations continued to prepare for the use of such weapons, uh, we don't know. Uh, uh, that's a discussion for another day. But nuclear weapons seem somehow to be different, although all the same questions might be asked about them. <clears throat> we seem to be locked in uh, to a competition with our potential enemies. Now that the nuclear genie is out of the bottle, now that uh, a lot of states have nuclear weapons now that the technology is widely available. Um, <clears throat> and for other reasons that I suggested earlier, not least the avarice of nuclear uh, weapons defense contractors uh, who make uh, billions in profits off these weapons. Uh, we seem to have gotten locked in, baked in 
uh, <clears throat> uh, to a posture where we just don't know quite how to get rid of these weapons safely. Uh, <clears throat> thinking about the 2017 United Nations uh, uh, treaty on the elimination of nuclear weapons. Uh, it's not hard to imagine an agreement among the nuclear states that would have each of them uh, reduce their inventories of nuclear weapons stepwise over a period of time <clears throat> with uh, very intrusive inspections to make sure that everybody is playing by the same rules. Uh, that would eventually lead us to uh, uh, the elimination of all weapons, or at least to get us down to a level where um, there'd be so few that they wouldn't threaten all of humankind. But um, we just haven't been able to do that yet. We haven't been able to break the old habit of asserting um, uh, U.S. superiority um, and uh, reorganizing our uh, uh, strategy to uh, find other ways to defend ourselves. Okay, thank you. A question from the audience um, regarding your anecdote about President Nixon's inebriated state prior to stepping down and to the perils presented by our most recent president, I'm wondering whether Congress has authority to require some kind of system like that in Nixon's case. What are the constitutional implications? Well, it's a good question. <clears throat> First of all, the, uh, the irrigation of authority by the uh, two secretaries in the Nixon case was obviously uh, unconstitutional. Uh, they weren't uh, given that authority either by Congress or by the president. Um, uh, it's only because the context in which all that occurred that they might have actually succeeded in stopping uh, a crazy order from Nixon to uh, set off a nuclear war. The, um, the Constitution in, uh, uh, in the 25th Amendment provides a mechanism for a president who is impaired somehow as uh, Trump may have been last year to uh, <clears throat> hand off uh, the responsibilities of the president to the vice president. But in this case, Trump refused to um, uh, pass the nuclear football off to Mike Pence. Um, <clears throat> whether Congress could uh, require uh, a handoff like that is, I think, unclear given the ambiguity of the of Article 2, which addresses the president's powers as commander in chief. <clears throat> um, and even if Congress undertook to do that, which I doubt it will, um, uh, the questions uh, about criteria for the handoff, that is uh, when and under what circumstances the president might be forced to surrender the nuclear football uh, would be uh, uh, imagining such criteria is um, daunting. So, um, I don't see any of that happening, frankly. And uh, once again, I think the, the ultimate protection against a rogue president or an incompetent or inebriated uh, or ill president uh, who might do something crazy 
uh, and irreversible is to get rid of the tools that might uh, allow him to do that for her. Thank you. Um, has the U.S. signed on to any accords such as those you described that recognize the destruction of nuclear weapons on the environment? The United States is a, <clears throat> excuse me, is a party to the Environmental Modification Treaty of 1977. <clears throat> it is not a party to the uh, Protocol of One of the 1977 of, of the Geneva Conventions, although it has accepted uh, the part of that protocol, that treaty uh, that I mentioned as reflecting customary international law. Nevertheless, uh, the United States has uh, been clear that it regards nuclear weapons as not covered by those provisions. Okay, thank you. Well, we are just about out of time, so I think we'll end right there and wrap up today's talk. Thank you again, Professor Dykus, for your really interesting presentation. And thank you to our viewers for joining us today. Our next Hot Topics talk will be right here on June 22nd at noon Eastern time, and we hope you can join us then. Thanks, everyone.